enjoy a few success with the bed. But you look pleased. I, I have been engaged in a matter of some sort of man, which is not yet ripe for discovery. Are you jealous? And as often as you see Richwood entertained by Millen? Far from understanding I am, if not of her cousin. Well, you do her wrong. For to give her her due, she has wit. She has beauty enough to make any man work. <coughs> and can't place him enough not to contradict him who shall tell her so. For a passionate lover, methinks you're somewhat to discern a man in the failings of your mistress. And for a discerning man, somewhat too passionate the lover. For I like her with all her faults. Nay. <coughs> for I like her for all her faults. Her bodies are so natural, so artful, that they become her. Those affectations fit and other women would be odious. So I've got to make her my like people. I'll tell you, friend, all she wants to be with that instrument. That in revenge I took her to pieces, sifted and separated her feet. I studied them and got them by road. Catalogue was so large I was not without hopes. One day or other to create a heart of it. To which end? I so used myself to think of them that at length, contrary to my design and expectation, they began to give me every hour less and less disturbance. Till in a few days it became habitual to me to remember them without being deceived. They've now grown as familiar to me as my own frailties. And in a little time longer, I should learn to write them as well. Well, marry her, marry her. But he's half as well acquainted with her virtues, the charms, as you are with the defects. And to my rightfulness, you are your own man again. Say you, so. <laughs> I, I expect. I have a wife, and so forth. But what? Is, is the chief of that noble family down, so we'll fall which one? Well, he's expected today. Do you know him? I've seen him. He promises to be an extraordinary person. I think you have the honor to be related to him. Ah, yes. He is half-brother to the sweet by a former cousin who was sister to my lady Wishbat, my wife's mother. So if you marry Milamo, who we must call cousins to. I'd rather be his relation than his acquaintance. Well, he comes to town in order to equip himself for travel. For travel? Why, the man I need is about 30. Tis no matter for that. Tis for the honor of all England that all Europe should know that we have blocked it for all ages. I wonder why there's not an act of parliament to save the credit of the nation, employing the expectation of fools. Ah, it is better, it is. It is better to trade with little loss than to be quite eaten up with being overstocked. Pray, are the hobbies of the Sinai's errand, those of the squire's brother, anything related? Not at all. One will melt in your mouth. The other will set all your teeth on edge. One's all pulp, and the other's all core. So one will be rotten before he be ripe, and the other will be rotten without ever being ripe at all. So willful is an odd mixture of bashfulness and obstinacy. But when he's drunk, he's loving. And to give the other something of his due, he is something of good nature and does not always want to quit. Not always. But as often as his memory fails and <coughs> commonplace of comparisons, Whitwood is a fool with a good memory and some few scraps of other folks' wit. He is one whose conversation can never be approved of, yet it is now and then to be endured. He has indeed one good quality. He is not exceptious. For he so passionately affects the reputation of understanding regularly that you will construe an affront into a jest. You call downright rudeness in your language satire and fire. Well, if you have a mind to finish this full picture, you have an opportunity to do it at full length. 
Behold, the original witch watch. A fool may your compassion, my dears. Pity me, Fainall. Mirabel, pity me. I do from my soul. Why? What's the matter? No letters for me, Betty? Did not the letter to bring you one but now, sir? Aye. But no other. No, sir. That's hard. That's very hard. A messenger. That beast of burden has brought me a letter from the fool, my brother. How sorry of the pandemic in a funeral, sir. What's worse? Just a sure forerunner of your turn and never so many catering. A fool and your brother, which one? My half-brother. My half-brother he is. You're nearer upon honor. Then it is possible that he may be but half a fool. Good! Good, Mirabel! The troll! Good, good! Hey! Don't let's talk, Ben! See now! How does it live? Jack! I say anything in the world to get this fellow out of my head! I beg pardon that I should ask in the man of pleasure and the town a question that's once the forum and domestic. But I talk like an old maid in a marriage. I don't know what I say. She is the best woman in the world. Yes, well, you don't know what you say. Otherwise, your commendation would either go to make me vain or jealous. No man in town lives well as a wife, but be honest. You're just a miracle. You'd better step and ask his wife if you would be incredibly informed. Oh, my dear, I just said thousand parts. Cat, I forgot what I was going to say to you. I thank you heartily. Heartily. No, but pretty excuse me. My memory is such a memory. And what have you done with the <coughs> children? This reckoning is money. My money is yours. I have no luck to be. Well, you may allow him to win a few at play. We are sure to be too hard to be party. Things, you monopolize the wit that's between you two. Fortune must, of course, be his. I don't find that patronage confesses the superiority of which to be your talent with. Oh, come, come. You are malicious now. I would read debates. Petulance, my friend. Nay, I'll do him justice. I am his friend. I am a wrong neighbor. And if he had, the ten judgments in the world, he would not be altogether content. Come, come. Don't detract from the merits of my friend. Well, you don't take your friend to be over nice people there. No, no! Hanging the rogue is no matter at all that I must own. And no more freedom than a bumpay that I grant you. Tis, 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 pity me. The fellow has fire and life. What courage? Mm, faith, I, I don't know as to that. I, I can't say as to that. Yes, in a controversy. He will contradict anybody. Though for a man he feared or a woman he loved. Ah, oh, well, well. He does not always think before he speaks. You are to part upon him. You are big. Let me defend you. I can excuse most of his laws. Except one or two. One he has. That's the true fault. If he were my brother, I could not acquit him. I marry. What is that? Oh, pardon me. Expose the infirmities of my friend. No, my dear, excuse me there. Why? I warrant your friends unsincere. What is some such trifle? Oh, no, no. What did he be? Tis matter for that. His wit will excuse that. A wit should no longer be sincere in a woman constant. One argues a decay of parts as the other of beauty. Maybe you think it too positive. Nah. It's been positivism incentive to argument and keeps up conversation. To illiterate. <laughs> That's an avenue. His want of learning gives him the more opportunities to show his natural parts. He wants words. I but I like him for that now. For his want of words gives me the pleasure very often to explain his meaning. He is impudent. No, that's not it. Vague. No. What? He speaks unseasonable truths at times because he has not wit enough to invent an evasion. Truth? <laughs> not to see what happened. I mean, he never speaks the truth at all, that's all. He will 
alive like a chambermaid. Now that is a fault. Is Master Petrolin here, mistress? Yeah. Three gentlewomen will speak with him. Oh, brave petulance. Three? I'll tell him. You must bring some dishes of chocolate and a glass of cinnamon. Now, that should be for two husty trumpets and a board troubled with wind. <laughs> now you may know what the three are. You are very free with your friends and acquaintances. Friendship without freedom is a stullness, love without enjoyment, or wine without toasting. But to tell you a secret, these are trolls who only allow scorcher and something more by week to go live once a day at public places. Ah, you'll see, here won't go to them because there's no more company here to take notice of him. Why, this is nothing to what he used to do. Before he found out this way, I have known him call for himself. Call for himself? What dost thou mean? Me? Why, he would slip out of this chocolate house just when you had told him. As soon as your back was turned, then he was gone. Then tripped to his body, clap on a wooden mask and scarf, slap it to a hat he could, and cry in the name to the door in a trance. Where he would send him for himself. That I mean, call for himself, wait for himself. Nay, and what's more, not finding himself, at times leave a little for himself. I confess this is most extraordinary. I believe he waits on himself now, he's so long a coming. Oh, I ask his father. Something. Come, Reginald. 
Thou art no rest fellow. Shout me love to my mistress, thou shout me. What is thou heard of my uncle? I, nothing, Truth such a guy. Look, swords clash. Snatch the word. I shall and am silent. Oh, Mary. I know thou art a winning secret. I know you stayed in Middlemoss last night after I went. Tell me, was there any match made of me or my uncle? If thou hast but good nature, he will do thy wit. Will you grant me some sense for pity? Wait, I do what I can for thee, and I pray that heaven may grant it in the meantime. Well then, I. Pitchers here will both find really as warm a rifle as a lover. Ah, sure, sure. That she laughs at petulant is plain enough. And for my part, but that it is almost a fashion to admire, I should park him to tell you a secret. But let it go further. Between friends, I shall never break my heart for her. And uh, how? She's handsome, but she's a sort of an uncertain woman. I thought she had died for her. <laughs> no, but she has wit. Tis what she will hardly allow anybody else. Oh, damn it. I should hate that if she were as handsome as Cleopatra. Very well, it's not sure for us things for. And why do you think so? Well, we stayed pretty late there last night and heard something of an uncle who's come to town and is between Mirabel and the rest of his fortunes. Now, Mirabel and he are at some distance, as my lady wish for has been told. And you know, she hates Mirabel worse than a fish one that hates a hard frost. Now, whether this uncle has seen Mrs. Millimore or not, I cannot say. But there were items of such a treaty living in a brow, and if it should come to life, who will there would be in some sort? Unfortunately, but it is impossible that Millimore should ever hark into it. Faith, my dear, I can't tell. She's a woman and a kind of a humorist. And is this the summer which we collect last month? The printer says, um, Maybe Richwood knows more. He was there longer. Besides, they say anything before him. They do not mind. I thought you had been the greatest favorite. Ah, eh? Better then. But not in that day. Besides, I make remarks. You do. I am a false and malicious man. No, Richwood here. He's not soft, you know. Men of an awe. He tells us to well bred. He's a. What do you call him? What do you call him? A fine gentleman, but all oh, silly girl. I thank you. I know as much as my curiosity required. Fayon, are you for the park? I, I'll take a turn before dinner. I will all walk in the park. The lady stops being there. Pray then, walk by yourselves. And let us not be accessory to your senseless rivalry, which you will rout as often as the ladies pass by you. And when you've made a handsome woman blush, yeah. What, what? Uh, let them show the innocence by not understanding what they hear. Or else, let them show the discretion by not hearing what they are not taught to understand. Hast not thou been sense enough that thou wast to be most ashamed thyself when thou hast put another out of countenance? Now, by this hand, I take blushing either as a sign of ill breeding or guilt. Where modesty is ill manners, tis but fit that impudence and malice pass for wit. I like dear Marwood. If we would be happy, we must find the means in ourselves and among ourselves. Men are ever in extremes, and the dirty perilous. While they are lovers, if they have fire and sense, their jealousies are insupportable. And when they cease to love, they loathe. They look upon us with horror and distaste. They meet us like the ghosts of what we were, and as such, Life is truth is an unhappy circumstance of our life that love should ever die before us, and that the man should so often outlive the lover. But say what you will, it is better to be left than never to have been loved. To pass our youth in dying indifference, to refuse the sweets of life, for these one day must leave us. It as preposterous as to wish to have been born old. For we one day must be old. For my part, 
not my youth may wear and waste, but it shall never rust in my possession. <laughs> then it seems you dissemble an aversion to mankind only in compliance to my mother's humor. Certainly. I have no taste of those insipid dry discourses with which our sex of course must entertain themselves apart from men. We may affect endearment for each other, profess eternal friendship, or seem to look like lovers. That is not in our nature's law to persevere. Love will rejuvenate empire in our breasts and every heart, and soon or late receive and readmit him to its lawful title. Bless me, how have I been deceived? Why, you profess a liberty to see my friendship and my freedom. Come, be a sincere. Acknowledge that your sentiments are free with mine. Never. You hate mankind. Heartily. Irrefectively. Your husband? Most transcendently. I, though I say it meritoriously. Give me your hand upon it. There. I join you. What I've said has been to try. Is it possible? Dost thou hate those vipers? Men? I've done hating him. And have now come to despise him. The next thing I have to do is to eternally forget him. There spoke the spirit of an Amazon. And yet I'm thinking sometimes to carry on my aversion further. How? Faith by marry. If I could. But find one that love me very well. And would be finally sensible of ill usage. I think I should do myself the violence of undergoing this ceremony. You would not make him a cuckold? No, but I'd make him believe I did. And that sounds bad. Why hadn't you as good do it? Oh, if he should ever discover it, he would then know the worst and be out of his pain. But I would have never to continue upon the rack of fear and jealousy. Ingenious mischief! Would thou wert married to Mirabel? Would I were? You change color. Because I hate him. So do I. But I can hear him named. But what reason have you to hate him in particular? I never loved him. He is and always was insufferably proud. You have laid a false to this charge, of which his enemies must have quit him. Oh, then it seems you are one of his most favorable enemies. Methinks you look a little pale. And now you flushed again. Do I? Uh, I think I'm a little sick of the sun. What ails you? My husband. Don't you see him? Turned upon me unawares and has almost overcome me. <laughs> he comes so opportunely. For you. For you? And he has brought Mirabel with him. My dear. My soul. You don't look red today, child. Do you think so? He is the only man that does, madam. The only man to tell me so, at least. And the only man from whom I would hear it without prompting him. Oh, my dear. I am so satisfied with your tenderness. I know you cannot resent anything from me. Especially, what is in effect of my concern? Mr. Mirabel, my mother interrupted you in a pleasant relation last night. I would fain hear it out. The persons concerned in that affair have yet a tolerable reputation. I'm afraid Mr. Fennell will be censorious. He has a humor more prevailing than his curiosity and would willingly dispense with the hearing of one scandalous story to avoid giving an occasion to make another by being seen to walk with his wife. This way, Mr. Merriman, and I dare say you will oblige us both. Hmm. <laughs> Excellent creature. Well, if I should be lived to be rid of my wife, I should be a miserable man. I would have only only put one hope the consequence of which must put an end to all my hopes. And what wretch is he who must survive his hopes? Nothing remains to do except when that day comes, but to sit down and weep like Alexander, where he wanted other worlds to conquer. Oh, will you not follow him? A uh, face, I think not. Pray, let us. I have a reason. Are you jealous? Of who? Of Mirabel. If I am, is it inconsistent with my love to you that I am tenure of your honor? You would intimate then as if 
there were high feeling between my wife and him. She does not hate him to that degree she would be thought. But he, I fear, is too insensible. It may be that you are deceived. It may be so. I do not begin to apprehend it. What? That I am deceived, madam, and that you have been false. That I am false? What mean you? Come, come, to let you know the deceit through little eyes. You want nothing. <laughs> and I equally disembelled your mutual aversion. Your jealousies have made both of you clash till you have struck fire. Why? <laughs> I have seen the warm confession raining on your cheeks and the fire sparkling through your eyes. You do me wrong! I do not. It was my own ease to willfully neglect the gross advances made him by my wife. So that by permitting them to be more often engaged, I could take you the more often into my arms with full security. But could you think that because the nodding husband did not wake that ever the watchful lover slept? And wherewithal can you reproach me? With infidelity. With the loving of another. With the loving of Mary. Tis false! I challenge you to show an instance that can confirm your groundless accusation. I hate him. And wherefore do you hate him? He is insensible. And your resentment follows his neglect and insults. The injuries you have done him are proof. You're interposing in his love. What cause have you to make discovery of his very passion? To undeceive the credulous aunt and be the vicious obstacle of his match with Melamon. My obligations to my lady urged me. I had professed a friendship with her and could not see her easy nature so abused by that dissembler. Why? Was it conscience then? Professed a friendship? Oh, the pious friendships of the female sex! More sincere, more tender, and more enduring than all the vain and empty vows of them. Whether professing love to us or mutual faith to one another. <laughs> you are my wife's friend too. Shame and ingratitude. Do you reproach me? You? You upbraid me? Have I not been false to her through strict fidelity to you? Sacrificed my friendship to keep my love inviolate? And have you the basis to charge me with the guilt, unmindful of the merit? To you it should be meritorious that I have been wishes. You clearly misinterpret my reproof. I need but to remind you of the slightest account you once made of the strictest size when set in competition with your love to me. Tis false! You urged it with deliberate malice. It was spoken in scorn, and I shall never forgive it. Your guilt, not your resentment, begets your age. If yet you loved, you could forgive so minor a jealousy. But you're stunned to find that you are discovered. It shall all be discovered. You too shall be discovered. Be sure you shall. Why? I can but be exposed. If I do it myself, I shall prevent your faces. What will you do? Disclose it to your wife. Or what is past Frenzy! By all my wrongs, I'll do it. Publish to the world the injuries you've done me. Both in my fame and fortune. With both I trust you. You bankrupt in honor and indigent to wealth. Your fame I have preserved. Your fortune has been bestowed as the prodigality of your love would have it, in pleasures which we both have shared. Yet, had you not been forced, it's true, I would have ever repaid it. Had you permitted Midabel with Millamore to have stolen their marriage, my lady would have been incensed beyond all means of reconcilement. And the moiety of Millamore's fortune, which was in her possession, would then have descended to my wife. <laughs> and wherefore did I marry but to make lawful prize of a rich widow's wealth and squander it on love and Deceit and frivolous pretense! Death! What pretense? Am I not married? Am I not imprisoned? Fettered? Am I not a wife? Nay, a wife that was once a widow, 
a young widow, a most handsome widow. And that could be a widow again. <clears throat> but that I have something of a heart of deep roof, and something of a constitution to bustle to the ways of bedlock and this world. Will you let me reconcile to truth and to me? Impossible! Truth and you are inconsistent. I hate you and shall forever. For loving you? I know the name of love after such usage. And next to the guilt with which you would as first me, I scorn you for fairness. We must not part us. Let me go. Oh, come, uh, I'm sorry. I cannot. Let me go. Break my hands too. I leave it to get loose. I have not hurt you for this world. Have I no other hold to keep you here? Well, I deserve it all. You know I, I love you. Poor descending. Oh, that. Well, it's not yet. Well, what is it not yet? It is not yet too late. It is not yet too late. I have that comfort. It is to love another. But not to loathe, detest, or poor mankind. Myself and the whole treacherous world. Come, come, I'm sorry. No more tears. I was too late. I could not just let you and rest easy in my doubts. Pray for me. I'm convinced I've done you wrong. And will anyway, every way, make amends. Damn my wife. I will part with her. I will rob her of all that she's worth. And I will be with her anywhere, somewhere, to another island, where I'll marry thee. That's right. No more tears. Find your face, your tears. It's a piece of a cup. They are turning into the other walk. While I only hated my husband, I could bear to see him. But since I have despised him, he's too offensive. You should hate with prudence. Yes, for I have loved with indiscretion. You should have done so much disgust for your husband. As may be sufficient to make you relish your love. You have been the cause that I have loved without bounds. And would you set limits to that aversion of which you have been the occasion? Why did you make me marry this man? Why do we daily commit disagreeable and dangerous actions to save that idol reputation? If the familiarity of our loves had produced that consequence of which you were apprehensive, why would you have fixed the father's name but on a husband? A onion thing ought to be a man, lavish of his morals, an interested in professing friend, a false and designing lover, yet one whose wit and outward fair behavior gained a reputation with the town. Enough to make that woman self excused. Who has suffered herself to be won by his aggressors? Better man or not to have been sacrificed to the purpose. And the worst of not answered to the occasion. When you are weary of him, you know your remedy. I ought to stand in something for your credit with your river. In justice to you, I have made you privy to my whole design and put it in your power to ruin or advance my fortune. Who have you instructed to represent your pretended uncle? Wait for my servant. He is a humble servant of Walbert, my mother's woman, and may win her to your interest. Hey, stay for that. She is one and worn by this time. They were married this morning. Who? Wait for the foible. I will not tempt my servant to betray me by trusting him too far. If your mother in hopes to ruin me and should marry my pretended uncle, he might stand upon terms. I made him sure beforehand. So if my poor mother is caught in a contract, you will discover the imposter betimes and release her by producing a certificate of her gallants for the marriage. Yes, on condition she consents to my marriage with her niece and surrender the moiety of her fortune in her possession. She talked last night of interfering at a match between Millamore and your uncle. That was my father's direction and my instruction. Did she might seem to carry it more privately? Well, I have an opinion of your success, for I believe my lady will do anything to get a husband. And when she has this, which you have provided for her, I suppose. 
suppose she would submit to anything to get rid of it. Yes, I think the good lady would marry anything that resembled a man. Don't you know what it was a butter could pinch out of a nut? Female frailty. We must all come to it if we live to be old and feel the craving of a false appetite when the true is decayed. Here's your mistress. Here she comes, Evelyn. All the savours of fans spread and his crew was out. I'm sure of food for denders. I see but one more empty scholar. I've asked you every living thing I met for you. I've inquired after you as after a new fashion. Madam, truth with your similitudes. No, you met her husband and did not ask him for her. Are your leave, Bridgewood? That will I be inquiring after an old fashion to ask a husband for his wife. Hum! A hit! A hit! A powerful hit! I confess it. You were dressed before I came across? Hi, that, that's true. But, but then I have been what had I? Why was I so long? Man, your leadership skin to peruse of a few letters. Oh, I letters. I have letters. I am persecuted with letters. Nobody knows how to write letters. And yet one has them. One does not know why. They serve to pin up one's hair. Is that the way? Pray, madam, do you pin up your hair with all your letters? I find they must be copies. Only oh, with those in first, Mr. Richmond. I never pin up my hair with prose. I think I tried once, Mincy. Oh, ma'am, I shall never forget it. I poor Mincy, tift and tift all the morning, till I had crept in my fingers a farm and put all to no purpose. But when your leisure fills it up with poetry, it sits so pleasant the next day, so pure and so crisp. Indeed, so crisp. Not a critic with the Whitworth. Well, well, did not you take exceptions last night? Oh, I and went away. Now I think on it, and I think. No, now on it, I think I'm pleased, for I believe I gave you some pain. Does that please you? Infinitely. I love to give pain. You affect a cruelty which is not in your nature. Your true vanity lies in the power of pleasing. Oh, I ask your pardon for that. But one's cruelty is one's part, and when one parts with one's cruelty, one parts with one's part. And when one has parted with that, I fancy one's old and ugly. Aye, aye. Suffer your cruelty to ruin the object of your power, to destroy your love. Then how vain, how lost a thing you'll be. Well, it is true. You are no longer handsome when you've lost your love. Your beauty dies upon the instant. Your beauty is the lover's. As he bestows your charms, your glasses all cheat. The ugly and the old, whom the looking glass mortifies, yet after commendation can be flattered by it and discover beauties in it. For that reflects our praises rather than your place. Oh, the vanity of these men! Fail not to hear him. If they did not commend us, we were not handsome. Now one should know, one could not commend one if one was not handsome. Beauty, the lover's gift. Lord, what is a lover that it can give? Why, one makes lovers as fast as one pleases. And they live as long as one pleases. And they die as soon as one pleases. And if one pleases, one makes more. Very pretty. Why, you make no more of making of lovers, madam, than of making so many card matches. One no more owes one's beauty to a lover than a wit to an echo. They can but reflect what we say or look vain, empty things, if we are silent or unseen and want to be. Yet to those two vain, empty things you owe two of the greatest pleasures of your life. How so? To your lover you owe the pleasure of hearing yourselves praised, and to an echo the pleasure of hearing yourselves talk. How oh, fix it! Fain on, let us leave these men. Draw off which wood then, Marcus? me. How oh, can you find delight in such company? It is impossible they should admire you. They are not capable. Even if they were, it should be to you as a mortification. Sure, please, a fool is some degree of folly. I please myself. 
Besides, sometimes to converse with fools is for my health. Your health? Is that the worst disease than the conversation of fools? Yes, the vapors. Fools are physic for your next to ask you did them. You are not, in a course, fools. Mirabel, if you persist in this offensive freedom, you will displease me. I think I must resolve, after all, not to have you. We shan't agree. Not in our physic, maybe. And yet our distemper in all likelihood will be the same. We'll be sick of one another. I shan't endure to be reprimanded nor instructed. It is so dull to always act by advice and so tedious to be told at one's fault. I can't bear that. I think I am the sort of man. You may go. Well, what would you give that you could stop loving me? I would give something that you did not know. I could not help it. Oh, don't look so great then. Well, what do you say to me? I say that a man may soon win a friend by his wit or a fortune by his honesty. I've been a woman with plain dealing and sincerity. Sententious Mirabelle, really. Don't look at me with that violent and inflexible white face, like Solomon at the dividing of the child in an old tapestry hanging. You are a merry man. But I would say to one moment to be serious. What? With that face? No. If you hold your countenance, it is impossible that I should hold mine. After all, there's something very moving about a lovesick face. <laughs> but I won't laugh. Don't be peevish. Hey ho, now I'll be melancholy. I'll be melancholy as a candlelight. Here then, if you will ever win me, who will now? Nay, if you're so tedious, very well. I see they're walking away. Can you not find in the variety of your disposition one moment to hear you tell me that foibles light and that your thought like to speed? No. But how came you to know it? Unless with the help of the devil you can't imagine. Unless she should have told me herself. To which of the two it might have been. I'll leave you to consider. And when you have done thinking of that, think of me. Wait, I have something more. Gone. Think of you. Think of a world where you're more stelicates in contemplation. You're very tranquilly mind and mansion. The fellow that lives in the wind with has not a more whimsical dwelling than the heart of a man that has got in a woman. There is no point in the conflict to which they cannot turn, by which they are not turned. For motion and not method is their occupation. Well, here come my pair of turtle doves. What? Bidding so sweet. Is not Valentine said over with the two of you yet? Sir Ralph, why sure you think you are married for your recreation and not for my convenience? Your pardon, sir. With submission, we have been indulging in lawful pleasure. But with an eye to witness, sir, I have instructed her as well as I could. And with your direction and my instruction, your pleasures will be to a pleasurable extent. Give me joy, Mrs. Thurgood. Well, now, sir, I'm so ashamed of myself. I'm afraid my reading has been in a thousand required to read for me. And Professor, I made as much haste as I could. That she did indeed, sir. And it is my fault if she could not make more. That, I believe. But I told my lady she instructed me, sir, that I had to prospect the evening, sir, roll at your uncle. And that I would put a ladyship's picture into my pocket to show me. Which I'll be sure to see. has made him so enamored of a beauty. He burns with impatience to lie to ladyship speak and worship the original. Excellent, Paul. Matrimony has made you eloquent in love. I think she is profited, sir. I think. You see Madame Willemont, sir? Yes. I told her, sir, because I did not know if you might find an opportunity. She had so much company last night. Your diligence will very poor. In the meantime, Sarah's stand off, sir, on the Go on and cross the point. The farm shall be stopped and the knees made good if we prosper. I do not question your generosity, sir. And you need not doubt your success. If you have no more commands, sir, I'll be gone. I'm sure her ladyship is at the toilet and we will not rest till I come. Oh dear, she knows what that went by. If she's seen me with you, she'll tell my ladyship. I'll make this woman prevent her. The service, sir. What do you need for help? That's a rolling to you. That she is so hurt that she forget herself. Come, sir, will you endeavor to forget yourself and transform into Sir Roland? Come, sir Roland, any man in my position should not remember himself. 
married, knighted, and attended in one single day. What man shall remember himself in this way? And all I can do is think of how to recover my acquaintance with my old self and fall from my reformation into my reformation, into weightwear, eh? and I won't be weightful neither. That is the story of my life. To lose my title and yet stay with my wife. There will be an interval of five minutes exactly. Wait, madam. Mrs. Wattle has locked up and carried the key with her. A box upon me book. Fetch in the jelly brandy then. Oh, I'm as pale and as sick as the curate's wife that's always breeding. What has that to be wedged? Silly! Tasty! Does that one know the bottle? Madam, I was looking for a cup. A cup? Say thee? And what a cup thou hast brought? That thou take me to be fairy, to drink out an acorn. Why thou might as well bring that table? I come to the bill. Go to the matches. Set it down there under the table. Was that girl with the bottle in thy hand like a taxa? As I am a person that's wedged it in an inn upon the road before she came to me. Now for you yet. Not like a Mrs. Marwood. Oh, Marwood! Yeah. Let her go. I'm so pleased to find your ladyship in a reservoir at this time of the day. Oh, for the lost thing has been gone since morning and not heard of since. I saw her but now as I came to the park in conference with Mirabel. What? Mirabel? You call the blood into my face by mentioning that traitor. Why, I sent her to the park to negotiate an affair. Isn't it? I discovered I was done. Villain has wrought upon her to take me right. Oh, madam, you cannot suspect Mrs. Foible's integrity. He has poison in his tongue that will corrupt integrity itself. If she has a nut given him an opportunity, she has as good as put her integrity in his hands. Please, friend, hide behind that screen so I may examine Foible more please. Um, there are books to entertain you. The improfanity and the immorality of the English stage. And my name is what I Go, you think? See, here it is. Oh, boy, good. Where have you been? Madam, I have seen the party. <laughs> and what has thou been doing? Nay, it is your ladyship has done an afternoon. I have only promised. But a man. So enamored, so transported, who is a Roland, I say. Yes, but um, have you not betrayed me, Father? Has thou not um, detected me to that fatal mirror? What have thou had to do with him in the park? Answer me. So the devil has been for hand of me. What shall I say? Alas, Father, could I help it if I met that confident thing? Was I in fault? No, if you heard how he used me. All upon your ladyship's account, I'm sure you would not suspect my fidelity. Nay, if that had been the worst, I could have won. But you had a plague at your ladyship too. And then I could not hold it. In fact, I give him so. Me? What did the filthy fellow say? Madam, no, it is a shame to say what he said. With his taunts, tossing up his looks. Hmm, says he. I hear you are catching some plot, says he. You are so early abroad. Catering, says he. Ready for some disbanded officer. Well, so far away to the lady was. I have him murdered. I have him poisoned. Where does he eat? I'll marry a waiter to have him poisoned in his wine. Poison is so good for him, madam. Starve him, madam. Starve him. Marry Sir Roland and get him disinherited. Oh, you would bless yourself to hear what he said. He should be the superintendent, says he. I hear you are laying designs against me, too, says he. And Mrs. Mill wants to marry my uncle. He does not suspect a word of your But I'll handle you for that, says he. Do you want your privilege? I'll handle you. Oh, Jesus. Handle me with figures. I'll be married to I'll be contracted to act the sooner the better. It's that old incoming says I'm going to win. Incontinentally, madam. No new sheriff's wife expects the return of her husband after night with that impatience with which Sir Roland burns for the dear hour of kissing your ladyship's hands after dinner. Super and Frippery. I reduce him to chapters and rats. A tight and familiar. A slander mocked reader. A fainted prodigal. I'll do it his credit with his sailor. He shall have my meat with her fortune. Huh. I hope to see him lodged in prison first. 
handle for brass farthings with an old mitten. Thank thee for that, Hoy. This wretch has fretted me such that I shall never be able to receive Sir Owen with any economy of face. Look for you. Your leadish was bound to rashly in me. There's some cracks discernible in the white farthing. Cracks? Why did us? Match. I promise you, I have thought about it, and since 
insist your judgment until you find it again. I value your judgment extremely. Come, come, what I forgot my nephew will be here for dinner. Mr. Whitwood and Mr. Betty will not come tonight with your leadership. Oh, Mama, may I make me with you again? I beg you to entertain them. I'm not dressed. I'll be going mad with the guest. Sure, never anything was so unfair as an odious man. Ah, Margaret, the servant, you have a color. What's the matter? That horrid fellow Petula just provoked me into a flame. Is not all the glitter out of my hair? No. What has he done? Nay, he has done nothing. He has only talked. Nay, he has said nothing neither. But he has contradicted everything that has been talked about. For my part, I thought it would and he would have quarreled. I found them, I thought once they would have fit. Well, it is a lamentable thing that one does not have the liberty of choosing one's acquaintance as one does one's clothes. If we had a liberty, we should be as weary of one acquaintance as we are of one suit. A fool and a toy stuff would now and then find days of grace and be born for variety. I could consent to wear them if they would wear a lie. But fools never wear out, unless you could give them to your chambermaid after a day or two. Were better so indeed. If you would, but if you're barefaced now and on Mirabel, you might as easily put a petulant and witwood as your wooden scarf. And indeed, this time, for the town has found it. The secret is grown too big for pretense. Tis like Mrs. Primley's great belly. She may lay it down before, but it vanishes on her face. I'll take my death now. You are more censorious than a decayed beauty or a discarded toast. Minting, tell the men they could come up. My aunt is not dressing them. Their folly is less provoking than your malice. Town has found it. What has the town found? That Mirabel loves me is no longer a secret, that it is a secret that you discovered it to my aunt. Or rather, the reason why you discovered it is a secret. She were nervous. You mistake it, ridiculous. Poor Mirabel. His constancy to me has quite destroyed his complacence for all the world beside. I swear, I have enjoyed it to him to be so coy. If I had the vanity to think he would obey me, why, I would command him to show more gallantry. It is hardly well for it to be so particular on one hand and so insensible on the other. Pardon me, dear creature. I must laugh, though I grant you it is a little barbarous. What a pity it is! So much fine raillery and deliver that so significant gesture should be so unhappily directed to Miss Gary. I ask your pardon, dear creature. I do not mean you. Mr. Mirabel and you both may think it is a thing impossible when I should tell him by telling you. Dear what? But it's the same thing if I hear it. That I detest him. Hate him, madam. Madam, why? So do I. And yet the creature loves you. How can one forbear laughing to think of it? I'm a sinner if I'm not amazed to know what he can see in me. I'll take my death, Lord. You are more handsome. And within a day or two as young. If you should but stay for me, I should overtake you. But that cannot be. Well, that thought makes me melancholy. Now I'll be sad. Your merry note may be changed sooner than you think. Do you say so? Then I'm resolved to have a song to keep up our spirits. The gentleman stable to go, ma'am, and will wait on you. Desire Mrs. Hudson, that is in the next room, to sing the song that I have learned yesterday. Tis agreeable to my humor.
wits. It's like the falling out of lovers. But they were in the main, like traveling bass. How patient? Oh, I, in the main. But when I have a humor to contradict. I, when he has humor to contradict. And all I contradict too. <coughs> what? I know my cue. Then we contradict one another like two thunderbolts. Uh, if he says, that's that, I say it's blue. And let it pass off on that. If I have humor, it must be granted. Not positively must, but it may, it may. Yes, it positively must upon proof positive. I, upon proof positive it must. But upon proof presumptive, it only may. That is a logical distinction now, madame. I perceive your debates are of importance. And then learning. Importance is but one thing, and learning is quite another. But a debate's a debate. That I assert. Petulance an enemy to learning. He relies altogether on his box. No, I'm not into learning. It hurts not me. That's a sign indeed. It's no enemy to you. No, no, it's only enemy to them that happened. Well, an hatred man's my abortion. I wonder at the impudence of any illiterate man to offer to make love. That I confess I wonder at too. Oh, to marry an ignorant that can hardly read or write. Why should a man be uh, further from being married than he is from being hanged, though he can't read? And uh, as for the rest, which is to follow in both cases, uh, one may as well do it without the book. <laughs> so all is one for that. Is so, he a creature? Oh, if he has company, I'll be gone. Name, Bumblebee Wonders Fair. <laughs> what have we here? Tis your brother, I fancy. Don't you know him? Not I. Yes, I think I see. I have almost forgotten. I don't see him since the revolution. Sir, my name is Dressing. Here's company, if you please. Yes. Dressing, what? Well, it's but one young lamb in our warrant. We should not do an afternoon in our back down in Shopshire. Why, the black my aunt hasn't signed yet, right then? Your answer? My answer, yes, my answer. Your lady, sir. Your lady is my answer. What? Well, don't know how to know, you eh? Why, then, put someone here on that. How long has all this guy lay here, huh? I'll read that. Along with anybody in the house, except my lady's woman. No, why, then, thou does not know that lady. If thou sees her, right then? I 
English word of this mansion. Don't you know this gentleman, sir? I shall just not. By your lady, I know not whether this or no brother and to be. Don't go to Abby. Don't go to Abby. No, I need not to be cravatted than me, baby. Why don't you not know think I have to overdone?
jealous of her I cannot be. So there's an end to jealousy. We are you for I am, and shall be. And no, there will end to that, that were too much to hope. Thus far concerning my reports. Now for my reputation. Well, as to my own, I married not for it. So that is out of the question. Well, as to my wife's, uh, why? She had parted with hers before she ever came to me. So, that of bringing none to me, she can take none from me. It is against all rules of the game that I should lose to one who has not wherewithal to stake. Besides, you forget, marriage is honorable. Well, faith was uh, well, if marriage is honorable, and if you say so, why should a cuckoldom be discredit, being derived from so honorable a root? Nay, I know not. If the root be honorable, why not the branches? Well, well, this one's clear. How do we proceed? I will contrive a letter that shall be delivered to my lady when the rascal who's to have Sir Roland is with her. It shall come as from an unknown hand. For the less I appear to know the truth, the better I can play the incendiary. Besides, I shall not have foible provoked if I could help it. You know she knows some of the passages. Nay, I expect all will come out. But let the mind be sprung first, and then I care not if I'm discovered. Well, if the worst comes to the worst, I will tell my wife to grass. Besides, I've already wiggled a deal of settlement of the best portion of her estate, which I have carefully wiggled out of her, and which you shall party of at least. I hope you're convinced that I hate Mirabel. I do no more be chills. Chills? <laughs> oh, by this kiss. Uh, let the lovers still believe, but the husbands still be jealous. Or if the husbands believe, let their belief corrupt to endless jealousy. Or if they doubt, let the doubts converse to endless superstition and blind credulity. Tis true. I used to wear a badge, but I will disown the order. And since I take no use of them, I care not if I leave them a common motto to their common crest. All husbands must or pain or shame endure. The fools to jealous are. Too wise to be secure. Oh, is Sir Roland coming to his now for and is everything in order? Yes, madam. I put the wax lights on the sconces and placed the footman in a row in the hall in the best memories. I have you powdered the stable and the cushions and then made up the steak when Sir Roland comes by. Yes, madam. Oh, I, I'll just speak in the music ready so that he may be entertained in correspondence with the points of his passion. All is Ready? And how do I look? Most gilling well, madam. Uh, but how shall I receive him? In what figure shall I give his heart the first impression? Shall I sit? No, I won't sit. But I'll walk. Yes. Upon his entrance, I'll walk into the church. Oh, no, no, that will be too sudden. Um, I know. <clears throat> I lie. Filthy verses, so I am. 
So Willful is coming, madam. Shall I send Mr. Willful away? I thought we'd send him away. Or send him Hitler. Just as you will, dear for you. I think I shall see him. Shall I? I let the wretch come. Dear Fane, I'll entertain Sir Willful. Thou hast philosophy to undergo food. Thou art married and hast patience. I will prefer with my own thoughts. I am obliged that you would make me your proxy in this affair. But I have business of my own.
strange, as if we were married a great while, and as well bred, as if we were not married at all. How are there any more conditions, John? If the two your demands are pretty reasonable. Trifles. Ask liberty to pay and receive visits to and from whom I please. To write and receive letters without interrogatories or right faces on your part. To wear what I please. To choose conversation with regard to only my taste. To have no obligation upon me or bits that I don't like, for they are your acquaintance. Or to be intimate with fools, for they may be your relations. Come to dinner when I please. Dine out of my dressing room when I'm out of humor without giving you a reason. To have my closet in violet and to be the sole empress of my tea table, which you must never presume to approach without first asking me. And lastly, wherever I am, you shall always knock at the door before you come in. These articles are subscribed, and if I continue to endure you a little longer, I may, by degrees, travel into a wife. You will have fared something in advance in this matter that counts. Well, have I liberty to offer conditions? So that when you are dwindled into a wife, I may not be beyond measures enlarged into a husband. <laughs> you have free leave. Propose your utmost speak and spare not. I thank you. I covenant that your acquaintance be gentle. That you admit no small company down the intimate of your own sex. And that she frames to screen her affairs under your countenance, intend you to make trial of mutual secrecy. No decoy duck to read with your thoughts, cram into bed, bring you home a pretended threat. When you think you shall be found out, and ray at me for missing the play, disappointing the folly that you had to pick me up and prove my constancy is detestable. I do. I article that you continue to like your face as long as I shall. And while it passes current with me, that you endeavor not to new coin it, to which end, together with all vices of the day, I prohibit all masks of the night. Maybe I know not what. Hair is called, pig water, marrow roasted cat. I, I shut my doors against all the balls and baskets and pennywebs and China, muslin, fans, etc. I do. When you shall be breeding. Ah, oh, name it not. Which may be presumed with the blessing of our endeavors. Oh, yes, endeavors. I denounce all spray glazing, squeezing for a shade, to mold my boy's head like a sugar loaf, and instead of a child making a father to put it stick. Lastly, to the dominion of the tea table, I submit, long proviso, that you see what in your province and restrain yourself to simple and native detailed drinks, such as tea, chocolate, coffee, as likewise to genuine and authorized detailed talk, such as mending of fashions, railing at absent friends, spoiling of reputation, but that on no account you encroach on the men's prerogatives and presume to bring carols or toast to fellows for the prevention of which I banish all exhibits to the detail, such as Orland seed, orange brandy, cinnamon, citron, barbados, ratafia, and the most noble spirit of clarity. These reverses admitted, I may other things, be the tractable and good my husband. Oh, horrid provisors, filthy strong water. I dost fellows, odious men. I hate your audience provider. Send me a I read. Shall I place your hand upon the contract? And here comes one who may be a witness to the sealing of the deed. Here you are. What shall I do? Shall I have him? I think I must have him. Aye, aye. Take him, take him. What should you do? I'm in a heart of fright. You know, I should never say it. I think I'll enjoy you. Bye, bye. Have him and tell him so in plain terms, for I'm sure you have a mind to Are you? I think I have. The horrid man says if he thought so too. Well, you're ready for this thing. I'll have you. How about they kissed your hand? Here, kiss my hand. So hold your tongue and don't say a word. You're a bit. There's a necessity for your obedience. You have neither time to talk nor stick. My mother is coming. 
and in my conscience, if she should see you, would fall into fits. I may not recover time enough to return to Sir Roland, who, as Foible tells me, is in a favor to succeed. Therefore, spare your ecstasies for another occasion. Slip down the back stairs. Ah, uh, go, go. In the meantime, I suppose you have said something to please me. I am all obedience. Yonder, so willful, is drunk, and so noisy with singing and drinking. And Betty and Lewis were both quarreling as I came by. You know, if Mirabel does not make a good husband, I'm a lost thing. For I find I love him violently. So it seems, for you mind not what's said to you. If you doubt him, you best take up with So with what? How can you name that superannuated lover? Oh. Now, when you falls over, falls well. Yeah, my head leans to women above. Why does thou not speak? Thou art both as drunk and as mute as a fish. <laughs> Look here, Mrs. Millamont. If you can. Love me, dear, if say so. And that's the conclusion. Pass on or pass off. That's off. Thou hast uttered volumes, volumes and less than decimal system. Cyrobitulate. Thou art an epitomizer of words. It would. Thou art an annihilator of sense. <laughs> Thou art a retailer of praise, and dost steal in remnants of remnants like a maker of the bakers. Thou art, in truth, metaphorically speaking, a speaker of shorthand. Thou art without a fear, one half of an ass, and <laughs> Make a pill. Give me more to drink. 
take my purse. Pretty funny, my class, still in love with my face. When a man is falling on the road, he who waits for the house is an ignorant ass. For the bumper has not its fellow. But if you would have me marry my cousin, just say the word and wait for me to do it. Wherefore, we'll do it. That's my crest. My motto. I forgot. Um, my nephew is a little overtaking cousin, but this would be your help. My word, you should be obliged to him. He's been all very toss. Uh, I have drunk your help to be cousin. A match or no match, cousin. Cousin with a hard name, Wilful will do it. If she has her maidenhead, let her look to it now. If she has not, let her keep her own counsel and cry out at nine months end. I ask your pardon, madam. I can stay no longer. So Wilful grows really powerful. How he smells. If I stay, I shall be overcome. Come, cousin. Smells! You would be enough to poison a tallow candle out of his family. Go, go, get thee gone to the, to the tyrant Tartars, to the Saracens, to the Turks. Thou art not fit to live in a Christian commonwealth of peace. Me! Turks? No, 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 I know to talk in fashion, let oriental fools live by heathenish rules. I read that and OT cups and coffee. Now let British lads sing, crown a hell to their king. And be it for your sultan and so faith. Say, don't be patient. Good luck to you with that, that beast. Go, go, go sleep, you sot. Else, else I'll have you fascinated with bronzings. Wenches? Oh, hey, where are the wenches? <laughs> Get him gone, and I shall be bound to you inviolably. I have a prayer which invades you some precipitation, or I'll be bound to you more futurity. Come, night! Box on him! I don't know what to say to him. Will you go to the cock match? With a wench, sir? Let me find a key for that. Oh, horrible, horrible. He has a breath like a bat bite. Come, come, will you work? Leon, my Anthony. Man, follow me. My Anthony, my son, to me. This will never do. This will never make a match. Oh, sorry, no. I have to protect and must receive all that I may need constitution of their 
in our chambers one evening while you were at Hyde Park and we were thought to go on walking. Though we went up unawares, Madam Mahmoud took a book and swore us upon it. But it was a book of poems. So long as it's not a Bible law, we might break it with the same conscience. <laughs> this discovery is the most opportune thing I could wish. Now and say, my lady would speak to Mrs. Foyle and Mr. Miracle is with her. Foyle, you must tell Mincing that she must prepare to vouch when I call her. Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'll ask anything for your lady of service. We want to pray. Oh, dear friend, how can I enumerate the goodness that she would given to me? To you, I owe the detection of the faith in Serena. To you, I owe the time the detection of the impossible so ruined. And now, you are to be intercessor with my son and daughter, say the honor of my house and the frailty of my daughter. Oh, friend, you are enough to reconcile me to the bad world. Else, I would retire to deserts and solitudes and feed harmless sheep by purling streams and groves. <laughs> oh, Mahmoud, let us wait and become charity. Let us first dispatch the affair in hand, Mahmoud. We shall have leisure for people for retirement afterwards. Here is one who is concerned in the city. Oh, daughter, daughter. Of the bench and provoke naughty interrogatories. 
a more naughty law that all. While the good judge tickles by the proceedings, simpers under a graveyard, and fidgets often on this cushion as if he swallowed cantharides. Oh, it is very hard. Nay, this is nothing. If it would enter, it will win. But it must, after this, be consigned by the shot and writers to the public press, and from thence be transferred into the hands. Nay, into the throats and lungs of puckers with voices more licentious than the loud countenance. And this you must hear to your stand. Nay, you must hear nothing else for some days. Oh, it's insupportable. I'll make it up. I'll make it up. I'll give myself and my all, my niece and her all, anything for composition. Nay, madam, I'll advise nothing. I only leave it for you as a friend the inconveniences which perhaps you have to see. Here comes Mr. Fagel. If he be satisfied to put love all in silence, I shall be glad. Well, madam, I have suffered myself to be overcome by this importunity of this lady, your friend. And I'm content that you shall enjoy your own proper estate at your own life. On condition, you're never to marry. Under such penalty as I think convenient. Never to marry? No, Sir Rollins. The next imposture may not be so timely detected. That condition I dare answer my lady with consent. She's too much of the experience of her fidgetness with men. Besides, madam, when we shall retire to our pastoral solitude, we shall bid adieu to all other thoughts. Yes, I mean, that is true, but uh, in case of uh, necessity such as health or any such emergency. <laughs> if you're prescribed marriage, you shall be considered. I will reserve only to myself the power to choose you. Next, my wife shall make of me the remainder of a fortune in your possession. And for a maintenance, depend entirely upon my discretion. This, this exceeds our barbarity. We must go much, husband. But this must be agreed upon. And that possibly. Lastly, I will be endowed in my right of that six thousand pound, which is the moiety of Melamore's fortune in your possession, and which she has forfeited by contracting herself against your proffered match with Sir Wilful Whitwood, which she knew like a careful arm to provide for her. My nephew was non compos he could not make his addresses. I come to make an answer, and I will hear no objections. You have time to consider. Oh, yes. While the instrument is drying, to which you must, of course, set your hand. Meanwhile, I'll go for the same instrument, and while I return, you may, of course, balance the matter in your own discretion. This exceeds all insolence, all precedence, for my orders, and no mercy for me. This is severe indeed, madam, that you should smart for your daughter's want. Would have never married with us. But that was my choice, and this is hers. Now she's matched with a witness. Here come two more of my Egyptian plates, too. Ah, uh, uh, your son. Out, Caterpillar, I know thee not. Um, I confess I've been a little in disguise, as they say, on um, God's heart. I I'm sorry for it. I hope I committed no offense, for if I did, I I'm willing to make satisfaction. And what can a man say fair of? If I broke anything, I I'd pay for it. So let's not contend for what's past, for what's to come, to pleasure you know. I'm willing to marry my cousin. She and I are agreed upon the matter for a witness. How is this, dear niece? Can this be possible? Is this true? I'm content <coughs> to be a sacrifice to your repose, madam, and to convince you that I have no hand in the plot that you were missing from. I've laid my command on Mirabel to come in person and to be a witness that I give my hands to this flower of knighthood. And the contract that passed between Mirabel and me, I've asked him to make a resignation of it in your age at present. He's without a wait to leave for admittance. Well, I swear I'm somewhat revived at this testimony of immediate but. I feel I cannot admit that traitor. No, I cannot fortify myself to support his appearance. His appearance to me is as terrible as a god. If I should see him, I should turn to stone and lecture him incessantly. If you disoblige him, 
He may resent your refusal and insist upon the contract's dinner. Oh, and it is the last time he'll be offensive to you. Are you sure it'll be the last time I see him? I'll go get him if the last I sell on it, I'll see who stops me. This is precious fooling, if it would pass. But I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, what would you not call me? Not far, madam. I have to do immediately. Look up, man. She can't kill you. Besides, she dare off run desperately, for none of her faces are own. If she did, her forehead would wrinkle like a goat of cream cheese, but not for that old traveler. In the deep sense of the many injuries that I have offered to so good a lady, <coughs> and hearty contrition can but obtain the least glance of compassion. I'm too happy. Ah, oh, madam, there was a time, but let that be forgotten. I confess, I deservedly forfeited the high place I once held, sighing at your feet. Nay, kill me not by turning from me in disdain. I come not to plead for favor, nay, not for pardon. I must incline to only your pity. I'll go in where I never shall behold you more. Let me be it first, then afterwards forgotten. I ask no more. By your lady, a very reasonable request, ah, huh? and will cost you nothing. Come, come, forgive and forget while you must, you're a Christian. Consider, madam. In reality, you could never receive much prejudice. It was an innocent device. Though I confess it had a face of guiltiness. It was an artifice that love contrived, and the errors that love produces have ever been encountered me of. It is thick. It is punishment enough that I have lost what in my heart I hold most dear. That to your cruel indignation. I have offered up this beauty, and with her my peace and quiet. Nay, all my old future comes on me. Must be described to. 
or your darling daughter has turned adrift, to sink or swim like a leaky hulk, if she and the courage of this huge town can agree. This is insufferably insolent. Ungrateful wretch, as I not hope I may be, that may subsistence to my daughter's fortune. I will answer you. Will the rest of your daughter's fortune in my possession? But that you would not accept a remedy from my hands. I own I have not deserved. You should owe any obligation to me. Or else perhaps I could advise. <coughs> oh, Mr. Mirabel, I'll forgive anything that's past anything to cross anything to say me from an imminent tyranny. Oh, Lady Madam. But that is too late. My reward is intercepted. You have disposed of her who only could have made me a compensation for all my services. But be it as it may. I'm resolved I'll sell you. You shall not be wronged in this savage manner. Oh, you be so generous at last, Mr. Miller. Hockey, I'll break my nephew's match. You have my niece and her fortune. Will you? I'll take you at your word. I ask no more. I must have leave for two criminals to appear. Anyone, anyone. Foible is one and a penitent. Oh, my shame! <coughs> These corrupt things are bought and brought hither to expose me. Why? It all must come out. Then let it come out. Tis but the way of the world. Thou shalt not urge me to relinquish one tittle of my terms. No, I will insist all the more. Yes, yes, madam, I can take my Bible forth of it. So can I, ma'am. Margaret? Tis possible that you should have been a wicked accomplice to that profligate man. Have you so much ingratitude and injustice to give credit against your friend to the aspersions of two such mercenary trulls? Mercenary, ma'am? I scorn your word. Tis true we found you and Mr. Fainall in the blue garret. By the same token, but you swore us to secrecy upon Messalina's poem. Mercenary? No. If we would have been mercenary, we would have held our tongues, and you would have bribed us sufficiently. Go! You are an insignificant thing. Is this Mr. Mirabel's expedient? I will be put off no longer. You king that was a wife shall smart for this. I will not leave thee wherewithal to hide thy shame. Thy folly shall be as naked as thy reputation. I despise you and defy your malice. You have dispersed me wrongfully. I have proved your falsehood. Go, you and your treacherous. I will not name it, but starve together. Perish. Not while you're worth the groat. Indeed, my dear madam, I will be fooled no longer. More comfort, Mr. Mirabel, the detection of this affair. In good time, madam, your leave with the other offender to appear. What's that, madam? As your ladyship pleases. Give it to me. Madam, you remember your promise. Aye. Where are the gentlemen? Stead. What's this all to me? I will not await all your private concerns. Hola. What's the matter? Who's that out? Hey, hey. What? Are you all got together like players at the end of the last act? <laughs> you may remember, gentlemen, I once requested your hands as witnesses to a certain parchment. Uh, I, I do. My hand, I remember. Petulant, said a smart. You wrong him. His name is fairly written, as shall appear. You do not remember, gentlemen, anything of what that parchment contains. No. No, not I. I read. I read nothing. Very well. Now you shall. Madam, your promise. On my word. Mr. Fainall, it is time that you should know that your lady, while a widow, and before you had, by your insinuations, wheeled her out of a pretended settlement of the greatest part of her fortune. Sir? Pretended? Yes, sir. I say that this lady, while a widow, having, it seems, received some precaution respecting your inconstancy and tyranny of temper, which from her own passion of opinion and fondness of you, she would never have suspected. She did, I say, by the wholesome advice of friends and sages, 
learn it in the laws of this land? Deliver the same as an act and deed to me in trust. You may read if you please, though perhaps what is inscribed in the back may serve your patience. Very likely, sir. Prevail, what's this? A deed of conveyance of the whole estate real of Arabella language, widow in trust to Edward Millerman, confessor. So, sir, it is the way of the world, of the widows of the world. I suppose this deed may bear an elder day than what you have obtained from your lady. Profidus fiend! Then thus I be a vain hold, sir! Mirabel, it is your expedient. You shall hear more of this. Be sure you shall. Let me pass your own. Madam, you seem to stifle your resentment. You had better give it vent. Yes, it shall have vent. And to your confusion, or I'll pay it in the attempt. Daughter, daughter, it seems that thou hast inherited thy mother's prudence. Happy Mr. Mirabel, a cautious friend, to whose advice all is on. Well, Mr. Mirabel, you have kept your promise, and I must keep mine. Uh, for your sake, I shall forgive poor that <coughs> Sir Rosen the Bear. <laughs> but how do I bring the matter to my nephew? For that, Adam, give yourself no trouble. Let me have your consent. So Wilful is my friend, and has had compassion upon others, generously engaged to volunteer for our service in his action. The gods are up. I have no mind to marry, for my cousin's a fine lady, and this gentleman loves her, and she loves him too. They deserve one another. Well then, take it with all the joy that I can give you. I just in the matter, take it. Would you have me give myself to your over again? Aye, aye, and over and over again. For I would have you as soft as possibly I can. Heaven grant me, I love you not too well. It's all my fear. Good oh, God, sir, you will have done enough to die when you are married. But if you must die now, let's have some music so that you, one of lovers, might have some other occupation other than looking on. Let me, before these witnesses, restore to you the steam.
día. Urbita. Thank you. 